Hi, everybody. This is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. It is August 5th today, Sunday. And um, we're going to be taking a look at uh, a kind of fun topic today. Uh, this is something that I've been meaning to uh, give a talk about for a while now. Uh, I've titled this, Why I Wait to Look at My Kids' Birth Charts. And um, the, the basic reason why I choose to uh, wait for a long, quite a long time, a, a year for uh, my first daughter's uh, birth chart and why I'll follow the same policy and wait about a year to look at my uh, newborn's um, birth chart is what I'd like to talk about today, among other topics related to astrology and parenting, astrology and kids, family karma, a kind of slew of interconnected topics related to um, you know, uh, dealing with kids' birth charts and dealing with family charts and family karma and all sorts of good stuff. So um, that's what we're doing today. And then this week, I'll be getting back to some intermittent uh, talks about the upcoming astrology. For tomorrow, we'll be looking at the entrance of Venus into Libra and the upcoming square uh, between the 6th and 9th to Saturn and other fun stuff coming this month, like the solar eclipse happening on August 11th. But today, before I get back into my usual grind, I thought I would do something fun because my wife uh, just gave uh, birth on uh, July um, 30th um, uh, to a healthy little girl. Her name's um, uh, Summer, and um, she's middle name is Louise, which is named after my mother's middle name and my grandmother's middle name. My grandmother's middle name was Lou, and my mother's middle name was Louise. So Summer Louise... Uh, has just joined our family. Um, she's uh, a Leo with a Pisces moon. And that's about all I know about her so far. And uh, astrologically, anyway. So um, I thought to myself, I've told a number of people and other astrologers in the past, they said, did you look at your kid's chart? You know, when my first daughter, Virginia, was born in 2015, people said, did you look at the chart? What, you know, what was it like? And I said, no, I didn't look at the chart. I actually refrained from looking at my daughter Virginia's chart until she was over a year old. And I'll do the same thing for um, my daughter Summer as well. So I want to talk about that. Why wait to look at a kid's chart? And this will sort of spiral out into a broader uh, conversation about uh, what astrology can be used for with regard to families, family karma, parenting, what how parents maybe uh, some things that parents might want to consider when approaching an astrologer about their child's chart and so forth. So thank you guys. Nice to see a lot of you and um, uh, some familiar faces and stuff like that. So yeah, so um, I waited a year to look at Virginia's chart. I'm going to wait another year to look at baby Summer's chart. So what? why? Well, <clears throat> Going back to the ancient roots of astrology in both the East in places like India and as well as um, in the West to a large extent, um, the very basic belief that the soul is incarnating from uh, one form to another. It's called the transmigration of the soul sometimes. And so very simply, the soul, not the body, is what is real. That's a that's a cornerstone of faith for me. So I want to start with that because that's sort of the gist of why I don't look. Is that in ancient astrology, the soul, not the body, is what is real. And what does um, what does an astrology chart tell us about? Now, I don't mean to reduce or overly simplify what astrology is capable of. Astrology can point us to the reality of the soul, can aid and assist us in soulful living. And those are wonderful assets of our tradition. However, for ancient astrologers, in large part, um, especially, again, most people know I study yoga. We own a yoga studio. I'm a, a student of bhakti yoga. The chart is a description of the soul's uh, karmic destiny, you might say, in this lifetime, let alone what, or what to speak of an innumerable number of lifetimes that have been lived prior to this body in this lifetime. So a birth chart, for example, uh, the planets in the sky at the moment that a child is born are thought of as the sort of jury in a cosmic courtroom. They're the, they're the gods or the demigods, 
that bear witness to the life of the native and their configuration at the time of birth is sort of like a verdict. It's like saying, this is what's going to happen. This is what awaits this soul from their, uh, the karmic backwaters of its journey through many lifetimes all over the, all over the universe. Uh, this soul is here to encounter particular kinds of lessons, particular kinds of experiences, particular kinds of events. And in order to experience those and learn those lessons and see what it's here to see, to experience what it's here to experience, it also has a particular character and psychology, a particular body, a particular family, a particular time in history in which it's born. So the chart is giving us a sense of the parameters uh, of the life, the field into which the life is born, karmically speaking. But it's very, very important to recognize, in ancient astrology anyway, that this is not the soul. This is the soul's, like a, a map, so to speak, of the soul's current leg of the journey. Heraclitus, I quote him often, but Heraclitus, who was uh, sort of thought to be like a contemporary of Lao Tzu, the you know sort of author of uh, the Tao Te Ching, uh, sort of famous um, uh, Taoist text, uh, Heraclitus said, the soul is explored forever to a depth beyond report. And so similarly, to get to know a soul, we have to learn how to see a soul for something in ourselves and in others and in the world, whether we're looking at the soul of an animal or the soul of a tree or the soul of you or me, we have to, um, we have to approach the person in a sense, like we have to take our sandals off metaphorically, you know, we have to, we have to remove our sandals. We're on holy ground when we're with other souls because we're all like pieces of the divine whole. And so <clears throat> to really reverently know somebody, love somebody, cherish somebody in this material world, we have to know them for something more than uh, just what they are in terms of a set of descriptions. Well, I'm an astrologer, or I have blonde hair, or I'm like this, or I'm like that, or I tend to behave like this, or what have you. Um, <clears throat> it's very, very difficult to get to know anybody if we hold on to what in Sanskrit is sometimes referred to as our upadis. They're like temporary material designations, my, the color of my skin or my gender, or my sexual orientation or my, my socioeconomic status or my political leanings or my faith or my belief, you know, like if we, if we mainly look at one another in those terms, then we already have a preconceived set of ideas that uh, offer themselves to us as a way of relating. So we can relate to ideas with other ideas. It's really easy. We know that someone is a Christian in the South. You'll immediately have a, a list of stereotyped ideas and a social discourse, an appropriate way of speaking to someone based on the difference of their values and your values on paper, and you'll proceed, you know, and we do this all the time. And it's not like it's evil or anything, but that's just, that's just part of how we live. But you can't really, really get to know another person, another soul, a, another Purusha, a, a being, a spiritual being, an eternal spiritual soul, you can't get to know them if all you do is hang on to the temporary material designations that a birth chart describes. So um, that's not to say that a birth chart is, is soulless either, but it is to say that, um, you know, when you, when you go out to tea with someone you're first dating, would you make them take a Myers-Briggs test? I mean, maybe you're having fun, right? Would you, would you make them take a personality profile? Would you interview them? Would you, you know what I mean? No, you, you know, people would just get to know them. And the, one of the ways that we get to know people is by non-goal oriented activity. Non-goal oriented activity means quality time or touch, or if you ever read the five love languages, interesting book. Um, but it has five love languages lays out the different ways that we speak to one another in a sense, beyond our material designations. Quality time is one for me, for sure. If I have quality time with somebody, I feel like I really start to know them. All of the stuff that they are and that they do sort of fades away, and I can take interest in a person. And if they take interest in me, then, then something magical happens. We form a bond that's deeper. 
Okay, so this is the gist of why I wait to look at my kids' birth charts. Um, I'll say a lot, I'm going to say a lot more about this today, but the basic reason is that my kids aren't their birth charts. That's just not who they are. Their, their birth charts reflect something of how they'll be, of what they'll deal with, of the kind of uh, artificial intelligence machine, you know, sort of like the, their, it will describe their vehicle that they're driving within this matrix, but it can't get down to who I am or who they are, right? It can't get down to the relation of soul to soul just by looking at a chart like that. So one of the reasons that I avoid it is not just because I feel like the chart isn't my kids, but also because looking at a chart sometimes, and I'll say more about this in a minute, looking at a chart sometimes pushes us actually in the opposite direction. It's very easy to look at a chart and to start thinking about, well, their Aries or their Venus or their this or their that. And, and immediately we are seeing them as a, a list of astronomical phenomenon and symbols and so on and so forth. Um, I would rather uh, try for that first year of life before, I'm an astrologer, so I can't help but think about astrology a lot, right? So I'm not going to ignore their charts forever. But I take the first year because I want to get to know this person as a soul. What are they like as a soul? How can I know you? And for me, that means non-goal-oriented, non-mentally speculative relating. Whatever happens to them is going to happen to them. At this point, I really trust fate. I really trust destiny. I really trust the path of the soul for good, for worse. I just trust that in the end of the day, nothing can harm the eternal spirit soul. And, uh, and that even though from our perspective, things sometimes look like there's a lot of good here and there's a lot of bad over there. Um, I've had opportunities in my life, especially... Um, through a long stint of participation with um, the ayahuasca tradition from the Amazon to have a perspective of reality of my life of good and evil and so forth that um, was just something that took me beyond um, honoring and acknowledging the reality of those dualities by also sort of taking me past those dualities, giving me a glimpse anyway that something exists beyond them. And so I trust the path of the soul and I trust my daughter's reason for being here. I trust my reason for being her dad. I don't know what it is and whether it's good or bad, I trust it. So that inherent trust that I have uh, is for me eroded slightly when I get in my head um, about the chart. Um, now, I believe that this is actually a kind of homeopathic um, uh, teaching tool as well, that, that doing astrology looking at astrology in order to know something about our kids or, or whatnot, um, there's a good reason to do it as well. So I will talk about that. So I'm not just going to, you know, trash talk looking at your kids' charts. But here's why I waited for a year, basically, is what I'm trying to start with. So <clears throat> the soul, not the body, is what's real. The soul's, la the soul's language is love, affection, attention, connection, or attachment. So, um, uh, Here's the thing is that as soon as a child is born, anyone who has kids or been around kids, you know this, as soon as a child is born instinctually, it, it identifies the mother's breast and it goes right, right for the breast and it latches, it connects. And that, that connection is something that continues for a long time until the child becomes more independent. And um, <clears throat> in this culture, in this moment, one thing that I has become it grates on my ears sometimes is to hear people out in the world, including myself sometimes. I, I honestly, uh, with a Capricorn moon, can be like this sometimes myself. But sometimes you hear uh, they need to be more independent. Like get, get them independent as quickly as possible. Get that child independent as quickly as you can. And obviously there's great importance in a child becoming independent, right? But and, and we don't want to like coddle a child in a, in a negative way that debilitates them of their independence of their own healthy boundaries and whatnot. But the, the natural state of the soul, that very natural, most basic thing that the soul seeks is love, attachment, connection. Um, 
in the bhakti tradition that I study, there's basically the thought that goes like this, that we're, we're sort of like marginal beings in the sense that we have the free will to turn toward our original divine eternal source and connect with it and stay linked with it in yoga. Um, uh, or we can turn away from it and seek for that connection in things that are temporary, that don't last, and that don't really give us a lasting sense, a soulful sense of, of happiness. And so... Um, prioritizing the soulful connection to the source. And there's many ways to find that, right? There's many ways of living life that can keep us connected to our uh, divine source. But children need a healthy model for how to remain uh, connected, linked in a positive, loving, supportive, and mutually affectionate way. Um, and that has to be established as the bedrock of their incarnation in many ways if they are to be successful in finding spiritual fruit in their life. And so sometimes I really, you know, it really grates on me to hear people talking about, oh, get the kid independent as quickly as possible. Are you able to get back to sleep? Are they sleeping on their own like this? Or the top priority is like, get them independent. Just, you know, just sometimes it just rubs me the wrong way. Um, of course, I'm a Cancer, Capricorn Moon, so it's a it's an interesting balance for for me to look at those two things, so the, the attachment versus independence and so forth. But um, <clears throat> one of the easiest ways to teach a child from the get go that what matters is connection from their heart to other hearts, to recognizing the divinity and everything around them, and of modeling or mirroring for a child the the appropriate way into into to give your attention, your heart's attention fully to the other, the beloved as the sort of macro, the, the God or the um, God, goddess, the, the universal, the, the divine source, but also to others in the world, you're giving your attention to um, fully in heart to the people that you, that meet you in your life. We don't, we can't do this for people if we are modeling a relationship that is diagnostic rather than affectionate. So what do I mean by a diagnostic relationship? If we're always looking for what might be wrong, what needs fixing, what needs improving, where things could go bad, where things could fall apart, how a person is wired, what they're like, what they need, what their interests are. If we're always looking at people in terms of an, a, a, a conglomeration of parts that tell us, uh, give us information then really we're spinning our wheels in the realm of karma because the realm of karma is a, is a realm of stuff, lots and lots and lots of stuff. And it's not like it's irrelevant. There are very important reasons that I'll talk about in a little bit as to why we might want to look at that stuff and why it can be useful to look at that stuff. But it's not the foundation of what builds happiness in life to analyze. You'll, it's amazing. I see this all the time at our yoga studio and um, in, in many, many, many ayahuasca ceremonies over time. People will get caught, and myself included, in analyzing and dissecting what's wrong with me, what's wrong with the situation, what's wrong with the problem. And if I can get down through analysis to the root, then I should be able to like fix or remediate or offer some kind of compensating whatever. But the truth is that a couple of minutes of deep breathing can make the whole thing go away. And, and that's the actual, the actual truth. Not only will it make it go away, but then often what happens is um, the immediate stress of the situation will go away. And then if there's some lingering problem that uh, needs deeper attention, the most natural form of intelligence that we need to be able to address the problem arises in the heart, comes from the heart into the mind. So when we use the heart, we trust the heart, we, we drop into a space of trust, love, affection. That's that modeling of attachment to the correct source, it's like connecting our Wi-Fi to a good strong signal or our phones to a good strong Wi-Fi signal. And from that space, the natural intelligence of what we need to do to shift in the material world, the details of the environment, the biomechanism of our, of our suit, that intelligence naturally arises. Um, and so again, in the first year of life, I don't look at my kids' charts because I want to be able to try and address their problems, to learn how to address their problems, not from a diagnostic space, not from a mental space, but from the heart, from a, you know, from the the place of um, uh, my own, you know, nurturing 
in a sense, uh, nurturing intuition. Now, that is not to say that in the first year of life, something couldn't, might not come up that could make me turn to a birth chart just to get a little bit of relief from anxiety, because there are also things that, I'll, again, I'll talk about this in a few minutes, that could make a person very anxious that astrology might actually be able to help with. So I'll offer some counterpoints to everything I'm saying as well in a, in a little bit. But that's sort of another reason that I don't look at the charts, because we need to establish, like, I, and the other thing, just being totally frank, like, uh, as a, a man, and this is just, every situation is different, but a, as a man w w with a wife who breastfeeds, for example, I don't have a breast. You, you know what I mean? And so um, I'm already like in some ways, like like looking, I have, to, I have to work a little bit. I have to pull from a deeper space in myself to establish a, a heart-centered connection um, uh, that um, is really deep and emotional with a, an infant, you know, so it takes a little bit, I think it takes a little bit of different work for, for fathers in that respect. We have to, you know, um, work for it a little bit more to make sure that we also have a really uh, solid uh, signal with the child. Uh, I find that challenge really refreshing and good and healthy. Um, and so I'm all, I'm all for it. But as an astrologer and a guy who already can be up in his head about stuff a lot, this is another reason that I don't look at the charts for the first year. It's just, you know, I have to train myself that the most important thing that my child needs is not my astrological expertise, right? <laughs> but my heart. So at any rate, those are some of the reasons for me. So at its worst, astrology can encourage us to see ourselves as all the different kinds of temporary material designations that we're here to experience um, in the sort of, you know, uh, matrix of our life. Um, but these things are impermanent. And so remembering that the soul is permanent, whether it's your relationship with a child or your relationship with someone you're just meeting, a good suggestion is don't analyze their chart right away. Just give it some, give it some time to breathe, get to know them as a soul. And, and then the astrology can come in. Now that's my personal standard. You know, not everybody needs that. Not everybody, it's not like I'm trying to be super prescriptive here, but I, I do want to share this because I think it's a reminder that a lot of us who are interested in astrology could use. Um, so, so we have to learn how to listen and really see each other um, behind the stuff that describes our lives, our choices, our character. How many times have I had the most interesting conversation with somebody by hearing them um, reflect upon a choice that they made? You know, so they made a choice and I could judge the choice. I could judge their character or their life by the choice that they made. But actually, I learn a lot more by listening to people reflect upon choices that they've made. Right? And it's a similar thing is, uh, that's happening in that kind of example. We get to know people in between the cracks of the events and the objective things that describe their life. We get to know them somewhere in the spaces in between those things. And remember that we're not just creatures of uh, karma, destiny, we're not just creatures of events, we're also creatures of choice and we have reflectiveness, we're aware, we're conscious. And so to get to know a person in that space, the fruits of that is that you feel that you know them even though nothing about them really describes who they are to you any longer. Now that's a sign that you've get, getting to know somebody in a more intimate way. Astrology isn't always good at that. Astrology, sometimes at its worst, it can do many good things, but at its worst, astrology encourages us in some ways to uh, think of, our, of each other and constantly reduce one another to symbolic rhetoric and language. Aries, Pisces, uh, fifth house, tenth house, waxing moon, you know, all of this stuff. It's beautiful language. It can do a lot of good things, but like it doesn't do anything for me in terms of the feeling that I get when I spend 10 hours in a car with somebody. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so let's just, um, you know, just take that in a little bit. <clears throat> Some astrologers, especially in modern astrology these days, like to say that the most enlightened form of astrology is an astrology of freedom. They will say, for example, uh, that, you know, the, the most enlightened form of astrology is one that, uh, uh, recognizes that we are the captains of our destiny. <clears throat> so some people might say, 
well, I don't have any problem looking at my kid's chart because I'm just looking at the raw material, but it's really up to them what they do with that material. Okay, so here's why I have a little bit of a problem with that. For one thing, it's not traditional. Traditional astrologers did not believe that you were the total captain of your own destiny, not by a long shot. Um, ancient astrologers definitely believed that you had choice, that you had free will. Not everyone did. There were some real deterministic astrologers, but there's always been, even in India where karma is like such a, a huge and intricate uh, immediate part of life, um, you have choice. You have some choice. But your life is taking place within a field uh, of parameters that are defined by karma. And there are certain elements of uh, the fructification process of karma that are inevitable. It doesn't matter if you don't want it to rain or not some days. It's just going to rain. Similarly, there are many elements of our lives that are just going to happen whether we like it or not. And that's a part of material reality. We can see it in circumstances happening all around us all the time that we're not in control of, yet that have a very intimate, uh, we have a very intimate feeling of being connected with, that this happened for a reason. So it's evident around us all the time. But also, um, it's something that uh, it, commonsensically, we, we know that we, our will is not the measure of ultimate reality. Our will is limited. We have a will that can exist and a certain parameter of free will that is before us. Just like a dog has a certain range of options, a human has a certain range of options, a planet has a certain range of options, uh, you, you might say. So our, our free will is limited. So first of all, I can't get down with the idea that the chart is just raw data and it's totally up to you what you do with it. Mm -mm. That's just not part of my personal like astrological philosophy. Um, I can respect that some people feel that way, but that's not how I work with astrology. So then the next part is, uh, for me, is what do we do with the freedom that we have within the birth chart? Certainly living a spiritual life, um, having a sadhana, a daily spiritual practice, that awakens your consciousness, that removes anartas or sort of blocks from the heart. Um, these are all important things that can soften and um, shift the experience of fate, of karma, that can um, help us to uh, lessen negative reactions that we have to bad karma. For example, let's say you're an offender bender. Uh, if you're practicing medita meditation every day, you're less likely for that karmically sort of faded event to result in your free will choosing to punch the driver in the face for rear-ending you. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if you're like chilled out, well, less likely for that uh, karmic event to generate future bad karmic events because of how you react with your free will. So spiritual practice is very important and of course can make a big difference in our lives. Um, but I still, as an astrologer, have to recognize that, you know, 90% of the clients I've ever had in, if I go back in time to five or six major transits in their chart, I can pinpoint what kind of experience they had in what kind of area of their life with a great deal of accuracy. And that's generally speaking because uh, we are not the, the full captains of our destiny. You could think about it from a zoom out perspective. I've used this before and say that you have some freedom. It's sort of like taking a plane trip from New York to London. While you're in the flight, you're not the pilot. You don't have access to the pilot's deck. You're not going to be able to change the fact that you're going from one direction to the other. But within that airplane, during that flight, you do have some options. You could watch a movie. You could walk around. You could get into conversations with lots of different people, whatever. So that's one way of thinking about it. Um, the other way that can help us to not feel like, oh, fate, karma, it's so heavy, it's so, you know, I want more freedom or whatever, is that um, these karmic situations that we find ourselves in are also thought to be directly linked to free will choices that we've made in the past. So there's nothing in a sense from the sort of traditional karmic perspective at least from the yoga philosophy standpoint, that would say that your what you experience is not a result of free will, that it's intimately tied to free will, but it's also crafted in a way to teach you amazing lessons um, so that you can become more intelligent and enlightened spiritually as you go along. So at any rate, with that view of things, one of the, I'm tying this back into children now, when people say, um, 
I want to know, you know, what my kid's potential is and how to help them tap into that and get the most out of it. Again, why don't I take that stance? I don't take that stance specifically because our life and what defines the happiness in our life has almost zero to do uh, with what we do with the material situation that we find ourselves in. I know that's a radical statement and it, and people could easily say, well, you know, that's easy to say, like if you're wealthy or if you have a lot of money or if you're born in the United States or all different kinds of things could potentially make that easier for someone to say than not. But the truth of the matter is that this insight doesn't come historically from wealthy people or from people who are uh, privileged or from people who are, you know, like, like so good off. It comes from people who have deliberately chosen lives of simplicity, uh, poverty. It's, uh, it's a monastic realization a li- uh, that a life lived uh, with modesty and simplicity is where we find happiness, not one where we try to figure out what our potential is and figure out how we can get the, the best stuff out of our potential. That's never really been a recognized value of mystical traditions um, of any kind, whether it's Taoism, Buddhism, um, yoga, Christianity, Islam. You don't see anyone saying, yeah, figure out what your potential is and maximize it for the sake of spiritual happiness. It's more like be a servant, uh, learn how to be satisfied with less, be humble, um, learn how to stay connected in the heart to everything and everyone you do at all times, see God in everything. These are the kinds of realizations that have been thought to bring happiness. So no, I'm not going to look at my child's chart for potential. I'm not going to look at their chart and say, how can I help them maximize their, their, their goodies in life? That doesn't mean that I'm going to be like discouraging them from following their dreams or not trying to help them find their aptitudes or their natural gifts or abilities or their interests or feed their, their interests. What I'm saying is that I have often heard parents in astrology use the rhetoric um, of, I want to know what's in their chart because not because I believe that they're destined to anything, but because I believe that the chart shows their potential and I want to help them maximize it. So for me, I have to sort of fully reject this way of approaching children's charts for the reasons that I've just described. Now, um, the other thing that we have to recognize is that, and what I'm saying, um, there's already enough expectations too that are put on us by society by family, by the world, by advertising, by everything else that is already feeding them enough of the message of go and, and you know, sort of kick butt and take names in life. You know what I mean? Like that's the message they're going to get all the time. So if I can do anything for my kids, it's going to be to show them that, yeah, there's stuff that you have to do as uh, Professor Keating, Robin Williams said in Dead Poets Society, there's stuff that you have to do to sustain life, but it's not usually the stuff, doing the stuff to sustain life is not the same as what we live for. What do we live for? And then he goes on and he says, you know, poetry, art, love, you know, the imagination. Spiritually speaking, for me, it's very similar. Um, I need to be a model for my children that um, the stuff of life, your potential, all of that stuff that you're going to get fed, it means something. It'll mean something to your ego, just like it's meant something to my ego. I deal with that with my ego every day. I think we all do. But that's not really where your happiness lies. And you'll find that. And how can I model that for you? And again, for me, this means not looking at the chart to try and figure out what my kid's potential is going to be, right? But not looking at it at all, because just the fact that they are is enough. So I was reminded of this very powerfully not too long ago, and I went to see a documentary about the life of um, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers. One of the things that he said all the time to the children was that you are, uh, you are perfect just the way that you are. You're, you're loved and good enough just because you are. And I think that even in spiritual culture, we lose track of that. And so, again, for, for me, my work, it's not easy. I'm not like some, I'm not a, uh, like a standard bearer like Mr. Rogers or anything. I mean, God knows. But 
he's a role model for me in that sense. He was a role model for me when I was a kid. You don't see Mr. I mean, one thing that was amazing about Mr. Rogers is that he was surrounded by some of the world's most brilliant uh, therapists and analysts and so forth. And his approach was not intellectual for the most part. He was an intellectual man. He was a, he was a minister. He was a um, Presbyterian minister and he was very intelligent, but his approach was through kindness, through conversation, through careful, attentive listening. Again, um, uh, uh, a lot of the times when a parents rush to the birth chart for their potential, for their this, for their that, there's not enough of that just the way you are. Nothing that you do with your potential changes the fact that you, who you really are is an eternal soul that will continue on its journey after this body and all the potentials realized have long vanished after the solar system has died. We, if we don't have that scope of understanding when we approach relationships, even as an ideal that we fail at reaching but that inspires us i don't think we're doing a service to anyone and i don't think astrology is doing anything more than a uh, any other kind of um personality assessment you know or some way of um diagnosing or analyzing or breaking up a, a someone that is whole into parts so okay i've given you a lot there family society already puts enough on a child anyway there's already enough there the other thing is that astrologers can use astrology to diagnose children in the same way that helicopter parents can hover. You guys know what helicopter parents are? They're parents that tend to hover and fuss over every last thing. Similarly, as astrologers or people who are interested in astrology, we can uh, latch on to the stuff in a chart as a way of remaining uh, justified in our anxiety. Kids are a great way to remain justified in anxiety. I know this firsthand every day. Uh, I can... I can justify my anxiety all the time by thinking that I that there's something that constantly, because it's like having your heart outside of your chest walking around, as people say. So it's easy to have anxiety, and then it's easy to justify it because you're a parent and they're vulnerable and so forth. So similarly, astrology can be used to uh, hover mentally in anxiety around another being. Why do we do that? Why do we hover like that? We have to ask that question. One of the main reasons is because we project onto our kids a lot of our own stuff, you know, and we also um, we also have a, a lineage of family karma that we get wrapped up in, and that we we must a lot of us mistakenly believe that real healing is found when you solve your parental or family stuff. And it's, we're, we're sorely disappointed to find that we can be thinking about, dwelling upon, and healing family stuff all the way up until the end of our life. I can tell you this from watching all of my grandparents pass away, except for one grandmother who's left. All of them were dealing with, talking about, and concerned with the same family issues that I watched them be concerned about from the time I could understand conversations adults were having. So it doesn't go away. You can work through it. You can process it. You can work through layers of stuff. But we sometimes we place too much emphasis on ultimate happiness being found in the healing of family karma. Family karma is, in this realm, cyclical. And it eventually, um, you have to remember, too, that, in other words, family karma goes in cycles, it just round and round and round. In fact, the, the model of the universe for ancient astrologers was cyclical. Time was cyclical and the universe was more of a static structure. And so you're thinking of the universe going through an entire cycle of, of birth and death itself over and over and over again, in which case all family dramas are recurring. They go through cycles, just like war and peace go through cycles, just like good and bad go through cycles, hot and cold go through cycles, expansion and contraction go through cycles. Everything is cycling like this all the time, which means, and you can never get down to the root of it because this realm for ancient astrologers, again, the Platonic tradition, the yogic tradition was thought of as a reflection of an eternal realm, uh, sort of sort of perverted reflection of an eternal realm. But the soul turning its attention to shadows has gotten a little bit lost here or a little bit disoriented, you might say. So to get reoriented, we have to try to understand happiness as something 
that is eternal and that exists as a fundamental part of who we are, not what is happening in these cycles. That's a really, that's great intellectual realization, right? But it's a lot different to try and really embody that. To do that, we have to have regular practice in our life. That's not easy. So um, we also have to be careful because sometimes we think, well, I'm looking at my chart because I'm trying, I'm looking at my kids' charts because I'm trying to heal family karma. Well, good luck. You know what I mean? That's like you're trying to heal the fact that the universe will die someday or that the universe will eventually be reborn. It's like, in a sense, it's like a, a hamster trying to solve the problem of the wheel by continuing to go around the wheel. It's not to say, again, that there aren't useful uh, experiences in healing family karma. It's not to say that there isn't important therapy that should, should, you know, should be done with family, with parents, with spouses, with domestic situations. There's all sorts of learning and healing and growth that can be done. But when we rush to a birth chart when a child is born because we think, well, this will give me the information to help solve and heal the family wounds because that's my primary responsibility. My message is no, it's not. Your primary responsibility, which happens, it's byproduct, happens to be healing, is love. Your, the, 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 the loving of the child, when that comes first, the byproduct is that family wounds can be healed. And they can be healed in a way that is not uh, uh, the kind of, the stuff of, of fantasy, where it's once and for all, it's you've perfectly evolved to level 10 in your family, you know, whatever. It, it, it grants a kind of peace uh, rather than a sense of uh, final, uh, finally having solved something. So when we learn how to, the first responsibility is to love, um, then that, uh, again, generates like a byproduct, just like the intelligence from the heart rises up and teaches us how to solve a problem when we try breathing rather than analyzing. Similarly, um, when we uh, just allow um, love to be the way that we approach a child, um, then we do the most we can to heal our own family baggage and any of that child's family stuff. So um, the byproduct is family healing, not the goal. So at any rate, family karma, someone says interested in understanding my definition of family karma. Well, I don't have like a hard definition. I just mean that, you know, we tra we apparently we travel in packs some of the packs are disparate. They break off. They're in step families and all different kinds of, you know, strands and some broken or fragmented. It's, um, it's not like one tidy, simple white picket fence situation, but, uh, and it's generational. It goes back several generations. There's karma that lives in us from previous generations that collectively and personally that we can't possibly fathom. We're unconscious of, um, but, uh, Remember that the the guiding sense of what determines your karma is personal, not that you you don't have to be um, you don't. We, there's another thing that comes to to mind. This is the the martyr complex of the new age, where the new ager says, "Well, I'm meant to heal my family line. I'm meant to bind up the karma from seven generations past." And so I cut the cords in this dancing ceremony and I ate some cacao and I, you know, I screamed under the moon or whatever. And then like all the generations were healed going all the way up the line. How many bazillion times have I heard something like this said? Um, and I'm not, I, I don't mean to poo poo it because there is, I wrote a book about family healing vis-a-vis -vis ayahuasca for a long time. So I know it, you know, family healing does happen. There is generational karma. But the, remember that the main thing that one has to be concerned about is staying anchored in love in your heart, um, not in heroically taking care of somebody else's karma or your own karma or lifting the sins of your fathers or forefathers or grandmothers or whatever. Um, that stuff, all of it is, if your focus is on that stuff, um, then the tendency, the propensity is to get lost and to get diluted into egoic accomplishment complexes. The, the goal, again, is really simple. It's just uh, very basically to love, to love and to be loved. And so um, when I say family karma, what I'm saying, again, is just you know, the, the, the stuff that comes into our lives that comes from a wide variety of sort of, you know, um, family dynamics that we are a part of, let's just use a broad sense of the word family. 
and also uh, parents especially, right? It's very intimate with parents. So obviously there's very intimate, you know, karmic, genetic, hereditary uh, relations with our family. But the point is that when we make those the goal, when we put those in front of us, we are looking at the parts, not the whole. And to look at the whole as the focus naturally has the consequence of tending to heal, mend, and bind together parts that are frayed or broken or hurting. So it's just a, it's just a slight reorientation. Anyway, so all of these reasons, though, are why I don't look at the kids' charts right away and why I sometimes grow tired of some of the rhetoric around children's charts in astrology. Um, now, okay, the other thing is that we need to stop using uh, possessive pronouns with astrology so regularly. This is encouraging us to think of ourselves and to think of our children as astrological symbols. Not only would this have been sort of sacrilegious in the ancient world, um, but it, it, it would have been... Um, frowned upon because of the basic philosophical values of ancient astrologers. So when we say my Venus, my moon, my sun, in ancient astrology, you can imagine a teacher going, mm -mm, they are not yours, my friend. Those are gods. You do not possess the gods, right? <laughs> so you can get a little finger wagging from like a old stoic or platonic or yogi type of astrologer. No, no, you don't possess the gods. They are not, you know, the, the gods at your birth and the symbolism of what they represent in the sky is a kind of is a kind of uh, cosmic judgment, uh, a a language that is speaking to the nature of what you will experience on this leg of your journey. But you don't own the stars, you don't own the planets. They're not parts of you. They're saying something about you as a soul. So it's a very different perspective. But I find that that shift really, really helps. It really helps because I don't have to bear the burden of being you know, my moon in Capricorn or my sun in Cancer or my Venus in Leo or whatever. I don't have to, I don't have to, those don't have to be mine anymore. They're just planets, right? They're just symbols. Nobody spreads a tarot deck around and says, ah, yes, that's my sun card. That's my judgment card. That's my 10 of cups card. That's, you know, they're all like mine. That's my cup card or something. It's, but for whatever reason, because of the way that modern astrology has emphasized psychological character profiling, um, which is cool, it can do a lot of cool things, uh, we speak with personal, um, basically, um, possessive pronouns. So this is the other thing is that I don't want to think of my kids as I don't want to think of their Venus, their Mars, their like, like that. Well, what's their Mars doing? Or what's his his Jupiter up to or whatever, because again, then it's like, I'm equating, I'm, I'm accidentally sort of, I'm teaching my brain to start equating the child with being in possession of the stars. You see what I'm saying? Not only does that inflate the ego massively, but then it also it inflates the ego and simultaneously makes it responsible for the judgments of the gods. That's so distorting in my, in my opinion. So I don't think that that's a healthy thing to do. Um, at any rate, um, astrology finally can also just freak parents out, right? Like a parent will say they want to know something about their char their kid's chart and then they can find, they, they get the reading and then they're like, I can't believe I did that. I should just be loving my kid. Now I'm just filled in my head about my kid, right? So parents will actually have astrology readings thinking that it'll be really useful and helpful and then they'll get it and they'll realize everything that I'm saying. I've actually had this happen with people I've done readings for and they've reflected on this to me afterward and they've said, you know, it wasn't anything you said. It wasn't the tone you used. It wasn't, I just realized that I just, afterward, I realized that it kind of put me in my head about my kid. So maybe that's the simplest verdict. At the very least, I wait a year. So I wait a year to look at their charts. Then now you have some reasons to, you know, to think about why um, and consider them for yourself. Take what, take what resonates from this talk and leave what doesn't. But here's what I want to talk about next, which is, okay, so why might we, when a year comes around and I'm going to look at the chart of my daughter, what will I look for? Why could it be useful to look for? So now that I've chopped it all down, let's build it back up. First of all, when my daughter turned a year old, she had been struggling from constipation. And it had been ongoing and 
you know, pretty traumatic for us as parents, like trying to figure out, diagnose, you know, like, well, how can we help her or whatever with this health problem? And I realized that um, uh, just, you know, very early on that she, uh, Saturn was um, on her son. So she had a Saturn sun transit, which among other things can be known for creating blockages. I guess, you know, Saturn, a planet that's often related to blockages. So as she was a year old and I looked at that, I immediately got a feeling of relief. I could have easily been like, man, I wish I would have looked at the chart earlier. I wasn't. I was glad I waited. But there was some relief instantly. Like immediately I was like, I bet when Saturn gets off her sun, she's not going to be constipated anymore. And sure enough, when Saturn got off her sun, she was no longer constipated. Right? So that was useful like right away. Um, so I look now for stressful transits in my kids' charts, not my second, but my first. Um, I look, so if I say, okay, like Mars is going to be on my daughter's moon, right? Okay, like there's simple things that I can do. Now, you could freak out Mars on the kid's moon. They're going to get an accident or an injury or they're going to be really volatile or whatever. So you put them in a padded room, you know, put tape over their mouth, you, <laughs> like whatever you come up with to try to, you know, mediate the, the transit or whatever. Most of the time, it doesn't, it's not going to matter. The history of astrology is chock full of examples of people who did something to try and protect against the transit only to find that the exact thing that was destined to happen happened because of the result of, um, of trying to protect. So there's a great example. I can't remember. I think this is in William Lilly or I can't remember where I read this. It's been a while. There was an example of someone who thought that they shouldn't go out on a journey because of this bad transit. And so they locked themselves into their home and uh, then their home was, uh, their home was uh, robbed and they were um, killed. And this is like, this is like a medieval example. But this is like, you know, they were, they were killed because they tried to protect against the transit and the, the protection measure played into what actually happened. So if it's destined, it's destined. That's an important thing as a parent to remember. I know that people like don't, and many people really don't like the idea of anything being faded or any choice being taken away, but it's also anxiety relieving to know that were you sick when you were a kid? Did you have some bumps and bruises? You ever broken a bone? Did you ever have a breakup? Did you, did you ever blow money or get in trouble or get, you know, have to get suspended from school or whatever, all of the stuff that could happen. Um, that's, you know, a lot of the daily kinds of concerns that parents have, um, just remember, you had to go through that. And now your perspective in your adult life is that, well, you know, could have been worse. <laughs> it was part of life. So, the, the, you know, just trust destiny. It's really important. You look at stressful transits in a kid's chart. It's supposed to give you peace and a supportive calm because you know that they're going through something that's a part of their journey. So if you can look at astrology with that kind of peace and look at it from that angle, then I think it can be very helpful to uh, sort of preventatively look at stressful transits. If you can't, then don't look because if it's creating more anxiety, it's like, you know, you know, they say in a car accident, if you brace for impact, sometimes it can be worse than if you get, you know, sort of sideswiped, let's say on, um, and you weren't, uh, ready for it. Your body's naturally not resisting anything. So the resistance is sometimes what creates more of the problem. So similarly, if it stresses you out to look at your kid's chart and look for somewhat stressful transits, then don't do it. That's just a really simple idea. I look for stressful transits so I can be somewhat preventative also, but not controlling. So for example, um, when my wife and my, my daughter had a transit of Saturn to her first house ruler, which is health house, um, I said, okay, and it was a, it was a, it was a, I'm trying to remember, it was a conjunction. And I said, okay, like, you know, this could be a lot of different things it could represent. But, you know, on the downside that it's the middle of winter right now and on the downside that like, you know, something could happen. My wife was thinking about taking her to the health club and it happened to be the day that it was like exact and the moon was aspecting it. And I don't know, some, something was like that. And I said, ah, just let's stay inside today, right? Preventative measure, fine. I would never know if the preventative measure worked, right? There'd be no way of really knowing. But here's a case in point to what I was saying uh, just a moment ago. So she stayed in, 
nothing big happened. They decided to go out into the yard. It was cold. They played in the yard. She got a cold. It blew out into the flu. Okay, so like my preventative measure was a part of exactly what ended up being a part of how she got the flu. Okay, so preventative measures, but I've learned from experiences like that not to imagine that you're controlling the kid's destiny. You know, you know what I mean? Like it could be mindful. Like, you know, if a kid has a, uh, if a kid is drunk, don't put them in a, you know, don't put them in a car. Similarly, if a kid has, you know, Mars sitting on their ascendant, like don't give, don't give them a knife. You, you know what I mean? Like well, simple stuff like that I think is good, but be careful of being overly controlling or overly rigid about things. I look to understand psychology and character, but I have to remember that context is everything and that nature and nurture alongside of free will are all real forces and that the spectrum of what astrology can describe in terms of character is pretty vast. So, um, for example, my daughter is a Virgo rising um, with Mercury as her sort of ascendant ruler. Um, and uh, it's in Capricorn in the fifth house. My wife and I have both noticed that she has a particular fascination with um, ballet dancing and dancing in general, but she's really, she really gets excited about, uh, the, the form and the beauty of the, the dance. Well, doesn't that make sense? You've got Mercury in the fifth house of the arts and a Saturn ruled sign. You know what I mean? So there you have, like, she's interested in technical performance. Okay. I can pick up on that. That's hugely valuable for me as a parent, because I know that about Mercury in her fifth chart, in her fifth house, um, I can look at the things she's interested in and start saying yes to things that I know her chart says she's probably inclined to like or take an interest in, you know. Now, fifth house Mercury, let's say she starts getting interested in gambling, you know what I mean? Like the fifth house can go toward that, can lean that way too. Well, then I can say maybe not as good to to, I can I can discourage the shadow side of something and encourage the more virtuous or positive side of something. So having that knowledge in astrology charts is helpful. Also, similarly, I can know, okay, she's a Virgoan personality with a Virgo rising or she's a Sagittarius sun, she's an Aquarius moon. I can, you know, she has Jupiter right on her ascendant. I know, so you, you, you look at that and you say, okay, well, I know she's likely to bounce back a little bit more easily from things with Jupiter on her ascendant. She's likely to be very animated and uh, dramatic with Jupiter on her ascendant, possibly very wise, etc. But Jupiter's in Virgo, so maybe a little bit tendency to be a little overly fussy about things, right? All of that can help me. But how much, I'm so glad that I didn't know any of that really about her until like a year plus in. Do you know what I mean? Because all of that comes second to what I've already established in my heart with her. So it's helpful information. Um, so understanding something about psychology and character, we can nurture because nurture is also a force that is competing with nature, just like free will is interacting with our karma at all times. So too, our nurturing, how we nurture one another is also interacting with our nature. And this is, if you want to see a really great movie about this, go see the story about those triplets, the documentary film about the triplets that were born, disconnected, reunited. Brilliant story about nature and nurture. Anyway, um, I want to understand relationship with parents, with me and my wife, but I'm not going to make hard judgments like, oh, well, I am going to be like this. She's going to love me, going to hate her mom. Like, I don't come to conclusions I make observations and I let those observations be uh, something that I come back to every now and again. So I also don't look at my daughter's chart that often, maybe a couple times a year, I flip it open and I have a general knowledge of where the transits are in my head at all times. So I can always just check into her chart mentally and you know, like I'm always sort of aware if anything stressful might be happening, but otherwise I'm not in her chart constantly analyzing her as a person, right? So I'll check in though. I'll say like, okay, you know, I know, for example, that the ruler of her house of father is Jupiter in her chart, which is right on her ascendant. Kind of cool since I caught her when she came out of the womb. Um, but, uh, and I know, you know, her mother's signifier like that is Mercury and so forth. So we, you know, can see, you know, or moon, sun, you look at those things too. You can see the presence of those things in the chart and you know, oh gosh, 
I might have the potential to show up this way or that way for my child. And so I can, I can be a little bit more careful or mindful. All of this stuff is really helpful information. But again, imagine if you enter into the relationship with a child from the standpoint of trying to figure it all out from that mode of analysis. Now, I'm not saying every parent is like this, but I can't tell you how much of the time when parents want to know something about their kids, usually it's coming from the space of some level of the anxiety that I'm describing. So at any rate, um, <clears throat> I want to understand relationships with siblings, if they have potential siblings. Uh, that was not a fun experience for me thinking, thinking, I thought we were one and done. And I was looking at her chart, my first daughter's chart for the first time and seeing that there was like totally stuff going on with siblings, definitely looked like there was a sibling in the wings. And I was like, oh man, not going to happen, not going to happen. And then all of a sudden it happened. So, <laughs> so at any rate, Oh, how do they get along with one another? How can we help that relationship, if at all? Um, how do I um, also um, uh, how do I also foster understanding between two siblings? So all of this work I like to do with parents sometimes in what I call constellation work. For example, I sat down with a mother not long ago who wanted to understand her relationship with her two daughters. Dad not so much in the picture anymore. And we looked at all three charts and it was amazing. We were able to see connections in terms of men they'd chosen in their lives, patterns of trouble they'd faced, gifts that they had, natural aptitudes, natural challenge. I mean, all sorts of really beautiful ways of confirming different things that they had struggled with and, and uh, found as sources of strength in their relationships with one another. So how do I help other parents? Well, whatever age the parents are interested in, having a chart done, I let them decide. I never tell them my own standards. I never, I never say, oh, we'll wait till a year. No, I just, whatever. If a parent wants a chart at two months or 12 months or whatever, I've done it at all ages and I have no judgments against people who do it. I'm just explaining my own standards. And uh, when people ask me for my advice, should I do it? Should I wait? Then I'll give them my opinion. But when people approach me for a chart, it's, you know, I'm, I'm providing a service and so I don't make judgments. However, what I do is if it's going to be before a year, it's really early, like the first weeks or even months, I address things that are about a base, very basic things, a little bit about the character, what interests they might have, what gifts they might have, maybe a few very basic and very mild challenges that they might have, like, well, a Leo may not like to be number two, you know, some very, very simple stuff for parents, especially first time parents. Um, and um, just, and I know that from having been a first time parent myself, I still am like a total rookie at parenting. So, but at any rate, you know, very simple stuff to give them mostly excitement and to provide like a red carpet for this soul entering the world. And I emphasize through the reading, I try to say, this is, we're talking about their karma, their destiny, but remember that who they are as a soul will require you to get to know them beyond all of this stuff. So I'll say that to my clients, but I'm also very uh, gentle and very modest with what I say in the reading. So um, a few gifts, a few basic challenges, keep it very light and mostly uplifting so the parent can greet their child into the world, keep the focus on the soul beyond the karma. So now I'll say a last few things. All of this talk about love and, you know, feeding the child love is meaningless if we don't talk a little bit about what that looks like, because it's not just sitting and gaze, eye gazing until they're 15. You know, what I, you know what I mean? I realized that as soon as my first daughter got out of her, like, you know, started crawling, talking, like, you know, how, how we love is many times not just something that we do to someone, but it's also about the, the way that we create an environment around our, our children. So this is just basic rookie stuff that I'm learning myself, not that I'm some, you know, great example. But this mantra, which one of my teachers repeats often comes to mind, contentment is equal to content. So your content will determine whether or not you have contentment in your life. If we want our children to stay connected to the fact that your happiness is connected to who you are, not what you do, not, you know what I mean? And that that is the platform from which we can do great things in the world for others. 
and um, bring, bring love into the world. If that's what we believe, then we also have to set up an environment that is supportive of that. So I, I think of it in terms of the five senses. What sounds do I let into my children's ears? Uh, what sounds? Spiritual music um, is different for everybody, right? So my, my wife likes Bob Marley. I like Indian, you know, flute music. But, you know, putting good, wholesome, uplifting sounds into the environment, by spiritual vibration rises when we do that. What about sights? Now, I'm not like an anti-film or movie or TV person, but I think it's important not to fill my daughter's head with trash, not too much TV, not too much internet, not, you know. So, and, and if she is going to watch something, then is it something that enlivens her imagination, that's good storytelling, that's art, artful, that's tasteful? Those things are very important to me. Now, some people might say no TV at all. I respect you. I we're not there quite yet, though we don't have we don't watch any TV. We usually just you know Netflix things here and there, but still, um, what sights do we put into the eyes of of not only our children, but you talk about getting to know anybody in life, and fostering deep relationship with another person, having quality time where your eyes aren't constantly fixed on your phone or you know other stuff is really important. What about what touches? Um, this is also really important. Something my wife does a lot with my daughter is she gets her out in the garden, has her touching the soil, the plants, get her in nature, get her feet touching the ground, you know, stuff that we can easily forget. Get her hands in helping cook, getting, you know, because involvement, your involvement matters. Your involvement is important. Your presence and, and hands in the affairs of my life is very important. And physical touch and, and affection, really important. Um, also, um, what tastes? You know, are we making spiritual food or are we shoving Doritos <laughs> down our faces? You know, so uh, what are we eating? And this is, again, we're not like perfect examples, but we eat mostly, um, I'm a vegetarian. My wife's mostly vegetarian. Um, it, we, but we, the importance of ritual around dinner, we pray before we eat. I say we have mantras that we say, you know, we try to fill the all of the senses with a sense of connection in the heart, that everything's done with a little bit more heart. It is easy ways to do this. It doesn't have to be some crazy, you know, uh, crazy regiment that you're running in your house. It's sim simple stuff. Fine young cannibals fit into the uh, the fun category and the slightly deviant category. <laughs> So, those sounds do I let into my children's ears would be, generally speaking, like I would choose the fine young cannibals over death metal for now. <laughs> so, no offense to anybody who likes death metal. All right. Um, like, or you know what? It would be even more for letting into the ears would be um, noise without substance. You know what I mean? Any kind of noise that doesn't have something intelligent or beautiful to say. That's kind of my basic liberal definition. Something that's not uplifting. Um, what about what scents? I know the smell is funny too, but sage, incense, uh, essential oils. Like uh, for me, our, our home also filling our home with a sense uh, that every sense can be engaged in something that's spiritual, special, maybe a little magical or mystical. All of these things are very important. I wanted to add something little for all of the five senses just to reinforce that because it sounds very abstract, just love, you know, like, but no, it, creating that feeling of attachment in the heart uh, for our, our kids, it comes through a lot of different things. And again, if we are going to use astrology in our kids' lives at all, then I believe it has to be accompanied by attention to these surrounding environmental features. Because if it doesn't, the tendency for the mind without the environment lifting the vibration is for the mind to become a cutting, incisive, analytical, worried, etc. A little, it's amazing how you can look at a chart, take a big, deep breath of, of something beautiful, like the flowers that I, I fill my office with, or a plant, or a little bit of incense or something. And immediately, whatever I have taken into my mind about my daughter's chart is going to have a way of more peacefully integrating into my understanding and awareness than if I were to just like take it and not be attentive to the environment or space in which I'm, I'm 
doing the things that I do. So I wanted to put that out there as well. Now, um, <clears throat> can I fill my child's senses with the divine or hints of the divine without divorcing them from the world so entirely that they're bound to fall hard in the opposite direction? Why do I say this? Because I was a preacher's kid. Now, my parents were pretty cool, right? They were not like so strict that I had no access to like the outside world. But I will tell you that growing up around a lot of other preachers' kids and uh, knowing a lot of kids who grew up, the, the kids of psychologists, therapists, teachers, etc., um, is very important that, you know, if you want a kid, the natural tendency of all of us is to rebel against authority at a certain point, right? You hit that Saturn opposition, that first quarter Uranus square, whatever. There's a point in time where you're going to rebel, you're going to resist, launch into your own direction. If we have made the outside, the world outside of our spiritual paradigm or our astrological paradigm uh, inaccessible, then the likelihood is that the kid will take off in the other direction really intensely. So I feel like we also have to be very careful about how much astrological language we use in general, how much spiritual culture we use without any kind of outside, you know, a little bit of outside dilution because we're, we're trying to prepare them to be spiritual, but to be in the world as well. So that's a balance that's also tricky to strike. For that reason, I'll close with these thoughts. I also don't plan on talking with my kids about astrology or using the language of astrology around them at all for a good long time. I don't have a time, you know, I'm not setting a hard one year like I did with my daughter's birth chart, but I won't talk about astrology around them. Why? Because I want them to know me as me and I want them to see and understand the world outside of the linguistic like paradigm of astrology. And I need to relate to them and their approach to the world outside of that for a little bit too. It's natural that stuff will seep through. I'm not going to keep some kind of overly strict boundary. But I want it to seep through in a way that's natural, that's not forced upon the children, and that is also allows them to... Um, be their own thing and to th because here's the thing once you tell someone don't think of a white elephant immediately you just think of a white elephant if i tell my kids like you know all the stuff about astrology but oh you're not your chart you know <laughs> you know what i mean it doesn't matter you'll start thinking of that stuff as though that's who you are so that's what you are and so i also want to be very careful not to put into their heads the language and imagery of astrology such that they have no choice, that they're just inundated by it. I came to astrology through my own choice. Nobody was inundating me with it. You know what I mean? Plus, um, when you're a psychologist kid, a teacher's kid, a preacher's kid, as I was, you're already inundated by that world. I swung in my early 20s into some pretty intense addictions and experimentation sort of outside the cloisters of the Christian community. And I attribute that in some ways to the fact that there were, there were elements of my upbringing where I didn't have a lot of choice over what I was exposed to. And so, uh, again, I have blamed none of this on my parents. My parents were, I think, very good parents. Um, but that's just a part of being in that environment. So if my kids are already growing up in an environment where we own a yoga studio, where dad's an astrologer, mom's an herbalist, et cetera, et cetera, I have to, I want to tone those things down so that they become a part of the background of, of our, our family life, so to speak. So spirituality is something to surround ourselves with, but also um, not to inundate people with. And that's a tricky balance as a parent. So when we're thinking about doing a reading for your kids, you consider all of these things and be very careful. You could probably never talk to your kids about what you learned from an astrologer looking at their chart. Uh, I do believe it's okay for a parent to look at their kid's chart without their kid's permission while the kid is in their house and under their, you know, kind of under their rules and stuff like that. And they want insight. I'm very careful, however, if a parent says, I want to know what's going on. I want to know what they're doing. I want to, you know, if it sounds like a parent that's up to no good, I won't, I've, I've literally said to people, this isn't an appropriate reason for a reading. Um, you know, I'll look at you, your chart to help know something about their character or whatever, but I'm not going to tell you whether or not they're having sex with their boyfriend. You know what I mean? I've literally had to say that to people before. So, um, 
and, and, and there might be a context in which that question is appropriate, but the one I'm thinking of was not. So you can tell the difference in how people approach you and uh, the tone they use and stuff like that. But I, I, you can't, but parents will sometimes go right to their kids and, and they'll, they'll go right to their kids and tell them everything in the reading. And you see, that's why I've been telling you, you're like this. You got to be better. You got to do this better. You're not listening to me, whatever. Not cool. Don't, it'd be like if I ran off to a, a therapist who diagnosed my, my wife without her being there and I came back and held it against her. Like, oh my God, you know what I mean? Like who would do that? We can't do that to our kids. So we can't hold the, the astrology. There should be a, a se sense of separation on some level between your insight about their chart and, and, and them. So now if they're interested and they want to sit in on a reading with you and they're old enough and the astrologer is capable of uh, bringing the, the astrology to their level, so to speak, then I think that could be really cool. But um, that's something I've done a lot of actually. I've done a lot of readings for kids where I sit with the kid and their parent and talk to them. In fact, I've done, I did one reading like that for a young man who actually had Asperger's syndrome um, and his mother and him. And we talked about it. It was really, really cool. Um, I've, so I've, there's a lot of potential for astrologers to have an amazingly positive impact in the life of kids, especially in their teen years. I've done uh, at least 100 readings for teenagers who sat there and like we just talked about what they're into, what they're anxious about, whatever. You know, just because we live material lives doesn't mean that we're supposed to turn our noses up at, at our material lives. Even if we're, we're spiritual and this isn't, you know, our final destination, we don't turn our noses up at this stuff. So hopefully everything that I've said today is understood in that lens. <clears throat> Here are the potential reasons that astrology too young for kids at an age that where kids are too young could possibly sort of take them off track or take you off track or <clears throat> not help you establish the right kind of relationship out the gate. <clears throat> but it's not to say at all that a parent's anxieties, concerns about the material fate or destiny of a child or any of ours about our own is unhealthy or bad. Astrology is actually meant to tell us about elements of our fate or destiny specifically so that we can accept them with deeper equanimity and they can become multidimensional experiences, actually potentially very blissful experiences specifically because we've steadied our heart and our mind in advance. Astrology is beautiful because of it gives us that ability. So uh, not anything that I said today is absolutely not meant to sort of poo-poo or dismiss um, our material lives. But at the same time, now you know why I'm waiting, waiting about a year to uh, talk, uh, uh, look at astrology chart of my, uh, my new daughter. So that's what I've got for you guys today. This is a longer talk, but I wanted to address it. I get questions about parents and children all the time. So hopefully this is interesting for everybody. I'll look and see if there's any questions. <clears throat> Rochelle, as a parent and student of astrology, I give a lot of space for my perceptions to mingle with the observations of what is presenting, not projecting anything onto them. More interesting to watch it reveal. Yes, exactly. Very, super healthy, beautiful. I'm so glad you said that. Um, and Hannah's here. Oh, hey, Hannah. Um, and you, you, yes, thank you guys. So many nice, nice comments here. Great point on the possessive pronouns, right? Not like I, I say things like my Mercury. It's not like I'm, I'm like perfect on the, per, per, you know, the possessive pronouns. I'm just saying, you know, we, we think about what ancient astrologers were thinking and how much we use those personal possessives. Uh, let's see. Very tough balance, Spencer says. Yes, Spencer, your parent, you know. Wait until you get questions about their crushes. The struggle is real. Oh, right. Yeah, I know. First time my daughter brings home a boyfriend, they're like, details, kid. Time, date, and location. City, state, country, <laughs> latitude and longitude. All right. I'll be right back. <laughs> oh, look. Look, you, sinistry is not so good. Your first house ruler is in the 12th house, which means you have the potential to be self-destructive. You may exit the household now. Exit the premises <laughs> right now. Go ahead. <laughs> I, can, uh, I can see it coming. All right, let's see. How do we work through a pull towards judgment as we pursue the spiritual path? Um, well, I think uh, there is such a thing as um, spiritual judgment. Um, the, uh, in the Bhakti tradition, intelligence, like real spiritual intelligence, is something that helps us to discern 
between that, you might say, which is heart-centered or connecting us to the, yoking us to the source and that which isn't. And so judgment is actually a very important part of life. Um, but there's a difference between sort of superficial judgment and um, a more intelligent judgment. An intelligent judgment works like this. That there's something that's unhealthy. You may have to say no to that thing that's unhealthy, but you don't do it in a manner that rebukes, renounces, or directs anything negative toward it. Um, in fact, you do so peacefully and maybe even in a way that informs, instructs, or lifts up the uh, presence of the um, of whatever the influence might be that's not so healthy. So, For example, let's say that you're out with some friends and someone's drinking too much. Um, you know, the simplest way for you to be a good, to, to be a good example is to demonstrate, to demonstrate good judgment does not mean to judge them or their behavior, but to simply, you recognize it, you see it for what it is. It's not to delude yourself into thinking that it's okay either. And then you simply, you know, make a healthy decision for yourself. You say, I'm not going to drink. And if the person says, you know, the person keeps drinking to the point where there might be a, a harmful to themselves, maybe you say something, right? But for the most part, the judgments that we have in life are supposed to be, they're supposed to be informed by the wise heart. So it's a, a wise heart loves wisely and knows from the source of love. That's a different kind of judgment. It comes across in a different way. It's gentle. If you've ever had a really good parent, parental figure of any kind, whether it's a coach or anyone who corrected you in a way that made you feel special, even when they were correcting you, that's a form of judgment, but it's not one that damages or harms. So it's wise love. Okay, well, I hope that this helps. And thank you, everybody, for uh, it, was, uh, it was nice to kind of be with everybody again. I'll be coming on later this week to talk about the upcoming eclipse and some more astrological events coming up. All right, take care, everyone. Bye.